Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1591. And you know what I am happy about? We're really not going to talk about politics today. I am so sick of politics. Are you just so sick of politics? Yes. Let's talk about income property. <laughs> hip, hip, hooray. Yes, income property. But <laughs> that comes with a little caveat, a little disclaimer. I do have one political comment. And then let's just not talk about politics for a few days, at least, because, yeah. You got to be as sick of it as I am, right? Right, right. Please tell me you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can only take so much, right? Uh, anyway, here is my only political thing. The Washington Examiner is out with an article today that says, and it is so fitting, it is so fitting, you know, the concept of crony capitalism is really so similar to the concept of fascism. And guess what? The newly appointed, well, <laughs> appointed, assuming he wins the election, Joe Biden coronavirus task force member will be profiting off of the Joe Biden espoused lockdowns. Yes, yes, yes. So Biden has appointed to his potential administration this guy who directly profits from the whole government response under his administration, not Trump's administration, to the coronavirus, uh, and he's on the task force. So what do you think he's going to say? He's going to say, do all the things that make me money because I'm an evil profiteer and Thank, uh, he's going to say, thank God I am not getting drained with the swamp <laughs> because it's a new era. It's a new era of four years of crony capitalism. And guess what? Guess what? If I give Hunter Biden a consulting gig for $2 million a year, where he does basically nothing at all, I'll get my way in the administration and I'll get favoritism and goodies handed out to me, things that will benefit me and my businesses that will not benefit the taxpayer and the general public. That's what this man says. It's not me speaking, it's him. I'm talking for him. That's what he's thinking. Hashtag scumbag. Well, scumbags, right? It's it's just, this is just evil, you know? This is just evil stuff, folks. It's evil everywhere. And I got to hand it to the EU sometimes. I mean, mostly Europe's an epic disaster, right? But, you know, the vibe of Europe, of the EU, is that they just care more about their citizens than the U.S. does. What do I mean by that? The U.S. is just like sold out to the gods of money, right? And and whatever makes money, you know, the U.S. is going to do. Now, I must admit, I posted last week on my Facebook page, and by the way, I'm much more into MeWe and Parler. That's the future. Facebook is the past. And I am extricating myself to a large extent from Facebook because I am fed up fed up, I tell you, fed up with these rotten, evil, big tech social media companies just screwing us all. Yes, I am 
I'm not totally done. I'm not saying that, but I am I am moving my attention and my contributions to these platforms are becoming minimized and I suggest you do the same thing because they are they need to they need to learn their lesson and you see all these people that have moved to MeWe, which is another social network, it's kind of a funny name, MeWe, and to Parler, and by the way, that's not the way it's pronounced, it's a French word, and I think it means freedom or something like that. Anyway, where they aren't censoring people, so they're all leaving. But speaking of big, disgusting tech companies, the EU, thankfully, is now prosecuting Amazon.com with new antitrust probes and charges. And uh, yay! Good job! Good job, EU! Good job, good job. And that's what needs to happen, folks. These companies are out of control. They're way too big. They're abusing everybody. And don't forget about Netflix, by the way. Netflix... Alphabet, aka Google, Amazon, Fakebook, Twitter, these companies, all shame on all of them. They've abused their... Don't forget about Apple. Apple. I mean, you know, Tim Cook, the moralistic Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, who's running sweatshops and abusing people in all these foreign countries, and then dodging taxes with all of Apple's tax schemes, which by the ones, by the way, are the same ones Amazon is using, and I'm sure all the rest of them are using too. The double Irish twist, all these ways to not put money back into the United States, yet they're exploiting the U.S. market to sell their their wares and their products. Yet they're they're disgusting citizens. They're awful corporate citizens. They're just taking the money and they're not giving back. Now I know they're giving back in terms of some employment at their incredibly low paying jobs, $15 an hour. Finally, Jeff Bezos increased his wages just so he could put all the other retailers out of business. And he's lobbying for a $15 an hour minimum wage that he knows will be very hard on all the mom and pop retailers, but he can pay it because this is just the way these scumbags operate. So thank you to the EU for prosecuting Amazon. And it's really unbelievable. Okay, let's shut up about all this stuff. I'm done with it for now. (laughs) <laughs> and today, by the way, our guest will be talking about Section 8 housing. And if Biden is our new president, we are going to see a massive expansion of this that I actually predicted under Trump, doesn't matter, wh- whichever way the wind blows, we're going to see massive expansion of these government programs. And that's part of my pandemic investing um, presentation. So beyond that, I just have to tell you one thing. We'll get back to this. We'll talk a lot more about it. But one of our clients, Mark, uh, Mark Anthony, posted a fantastic article in our content group about, uh, and I'm just going to quote here from this article. It says, quote, the United States is facing the most severe housing crisis in history, unquote, says Emily Benfer, an eviction expert and visiting professor of law at Wake Forest University. If you're scared that you won't be able to come up with your rent, you are not alone. As many as one in five renters, so that's 20%, say they've fallen behind on this this rent, right? And this is according to the Center on Budget Policies and Priorities. Well, I think they need a branding expert, that group. (laughs) They could use a better name, right? Anyway, it just goes on to talk about how there is just such a severe housing shortage. And guess what, folks? You, you, my dear listeners and investors, are the solution to the crisis because you are buying up these income properties. You're doing it for your own purposes, yet the nature of wonderful capitalism is that by pursuing your own goals, you are going to help a lot of other people at the same time. So bless your capitalist hearts. Okay, bless your capitalist hearts. Thank you for doing your part. 
Thank you for doing your part. And you're going to help solve this housing shortage and you're going to become very wealthy in the process. So we'll talk more about this. It's an ongoing thing and there's a lot to it, obviously. So future episodes, look for more on that. But without further ado, let's get to our guest. Oh, wait a sec, Jason. You can't get to the guest yet because you have a webinar to announce. So we've got a new webinar for you and it will be available. Come join us on Thursday and on Sunday. Thursday and Sunday, we'll do it again on Sunday and we're also doing it on Thursday. Go to jasonhartman.com slash sweet home. And there was an Alabama market webinar on there, but we have totally updated this. New slides, new properties, new information, new neighborhoods. So you're really going to want to see this. And guess what? It's all new construction. So join us on Thursday. And if you can't make it on Thursday, join us on Sunday for this webinar. Again, the link to register jasonhartman.com slash sweet home. Okay, jasonhartman.com slash sweet home. And we will see you Thursday or Sunday for that webinar. Okay, now it's time to get to our guest as we talk about Section 8 rentals. Here we go. It's my pleasure to welcome... Richard Capelli, he is the founder of Go Section 8, and a lot of you over the years have asked about whether or not you should do Section 8 rentals. That means uh, government assistance rentals uh, or government assisted tenants, I guess I should say. I've done both. I've told you about my mother's experience with them. As I was uh, growing up as a kid, I used to say that uh, my mom, who had uh, several Section 8 rentals, that she would complain all the way to the bank. <laughs> and um, and she always complained about them, but she always uh, took the money. And uh, every year they used to send her a postcard saying, would you like a rent increase? I can't imagine any landlord said no to that, but uh, she always checked the box, said yes, sent it back. Now things have uh, evolved over the years, of course, but this is a busy site we're going to talk about. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into the, the Section 8 topic. Richard, welcome. How are you? Thank you, Jason. Pleasure to be here. It's good to know that we're neighbors. We live uh, pretty close to each other here in uh, the the no income tax state of Florida. So what is Go Section 8 and what does it do? GoSection8.com from a landlord and family's perspective is a listing service, a lot like a Zillow or a Craigslist or a rent.com, but specifically for affordable housing. It's not just for Section 8, it's for all affordable housing, but primarily it's a platform where Section 8 families can and Section 8 landlords connect. It's a listing service on the front end. Mm-hmm. We're also a rent comparability service. We work with the largest agencies in the United States, New York, Chicago, LA, Miami, Delray, Palm Beach. Most of the housing authorities in the country uh, use Section 8 on the, go Section 8 on the back end to help run their program. But there's things that help them manage their waiting list. And there's another function that we built called Rent Watch, which determines reasonable rents for the program. That's important to owners, knowing that we do this because it helps them determine what rents they can get with the Section 8 voucher. Excellent. And so when you are a landlord and you have a property, uh, when it comes up for lease, you don't need to use or do anything special necessarily in order to attract a Section 8 tenant, right? You can just list it uh, anywhere you list it now on Postlet, Zillow, Craigslist, whatever. And a Section 8 tenant might come to you and want to rent it or your property manager. They might come to your property manager either way. So what, what is the difference or the distinction? Like why use Go Section 8? It's our network. We have a relationship with most housing authorities. So a housing authority that has a specific jurisdiction, for example, in Palm Beach, serves maybe the county or it could be the city. It depends on the agency. When you post a listing on Go Section 8, we send it to the agency, depending on their jurisdiction. And the agency has the ability not only to post it on their website, which they do using our portals, but they also distribute the listing in print in their lobbies. So it's a direct connection to the agency. The other benefit of posting a listing on Go Section 8 is you have to be aware that once you do find a tenant, and this is where all the tenants are, right? They go here first. 
So you're, you're likely to find one on ghost section eight and you can post for free after you find a section eight tenant, then you have to, you have to get an inspection and make sure that the rent that you're asking is reasonable. We built a method to streamline that. So the rent reasonableness functionality in Go Section 8, you're much more likely to get your rent approved if you use Go Section 8 because there is the ability for you to add comparable data and defend your rent through the back end system that we created, which is used by the agencies. Okay, so those are some reasons. Now let's back up with maybe the question I should have asked you at the beginning, but I was kind of telling the anecdote about my mother, a real estate investor. Many landlords really prefer not to be involved with the Section 8 program. Is that a good decision on their part or a bad decision? What are the pros and cons of uh, just renting to non-assistance tenants or to assisted tenants? So why Section 8? So when I hear people talk about Section 8, and usually if there is a stigma in that conversation or there's a perception that there is something wrong with the program, typically it's because they don't know it. It's fear-based. It's not experience-based. The program itself, if I wanted to tell you what the, just the pain points are, yes, there is some paperwork. It can take a little bit of time to get your, your property approved and inspected. Sometimes days, it's not that big of a deal. But once you go through the system and you complete, complete the approval process, which is really essentially, Jason, all you're really doing is you're signing a lease with a tenant. You're saying, I'm willing to take a voucher holder. Then, then you have an addendum to that lease called an RFTA. That is signed by the agency. So there's three parts to this agreement. That RFTA is what says the agency will be paying a portion of the rent. The lease is the lease. It's no different between a Section 8 tenant and anyone else. Now, when you do have a Section 8 tenant, there are some huge benefits, which you don't get in the private sector. And fundamentally, especially now with coronavirus, this is the reason why it's super, super high value. A Section 8 tenant, when they lose their job, can get a modification in their rent that allows the agency to pick up their portion of the rent and the landlord still remains whole. So not only are you getting the guaranteed rental income, whether it's a check or direct deposit, typically direct deposit, you're also getting a guarantee or a safeguard, an assurance that the rent income, whatever you're charging, will continue to occur regardless of environmental shifts. Mm -hmm. So a person can lose their job and you're still going to get your rent. So we just did a uh, we just did a webinar on rent insurance, which is basically an insurance program for landlords or tenants. If the tenant loses their job, it'll it'll pay your rent. So with a with a Section Eight tenant, you don't have to have that, or you don't necessarily have to have that. Like, does it depend on each office and each jurisdiction? No, it's a so it is a federal program run by each office. The rules are the rules on, on a national level. If a tenant loses their job. It's enough that the case manager is notified. They have to request a rent adjustment. And more rent adjustments came in since April than in the history of the program, wow. where, where the government is making massive increases to rents to cover the family's portion because they lost their job. Mm -hmm. So rent stability, we call that rent stability is a giant reason. Mm -hmm. The program also does pay market rent. It pays market rent. Now, we, we can get into how that works, and, and that could take a little time. But you can get market rent for the Section 8 program. It's not based on a fair market rent. It's not a published number. The program doesn't pay X per bedroom, regardless of the perception that that's how it works. It's not how it works. But it does play market, pay market rent. Okay. Now, the, the other benefit is the long-term duration of, of a tenant. Typically, like in my experience, I've had voucher holders uh, for 10 years or more. I did a little webinar for a, a real estate group, Century 21, and I got a little message on Zoom saying, this was last week, that they had a tenant for 17 years. So there's less turnover in the voucher program. And we all know, I mean, as real estate investors and landlords, turnover is the bane. It's, it just kills you. So mm -hmm. it's, it's financially, it's just a, it's just a pain and it's, it's so expensive. So that, that's another giant positive of the program. Plus you get to do good. You really do get to help those in need. So if you're getting market rent, you're doing good. If, if there's rent stability and you are sure that you're going to get paid, why not Section 8? Mm -hmm. So that's the question that we need to answer is why not? So mm -hmm. 
the paperwork can be can be scary to somebody that doesn't know anything about it, right? Like, what is this process? Like, how do I learn about it? It really is not that hard. Mm-hmm. It really is not that hard. There's one addendum. There's proof that you're the landlord. You have to prove you own the property, uh, providing a deed and some documentation. And then there's the addendum to the lease. Then there's the inspection. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, well, uh, that's perfect timing. <laughs> because as we were talking about off air before we started, uh, some of the complaints you hear from investors is these inspections and, you know, bureaucracy. And they say, you know, the government, nobody has an incentive to do anything right, you know, just other than their own personal will, <laughs> you know, nobody's on commission, in other words, right? So government employees tend to be less motivated. Uh, but, you know, what, what about those concerns? What about, uh, you know, some landlords think, oh, gosh, they're just trying to make my life a hassle. These inspections are ridiculous. You know, they're, they're too strict. These kinds of issues is what you hear. It's a safety inspection, first mm-hmm. and foremost, it's to make sure that the property is safe and habitable. It's not, it was never intended to be a burden to the owner. It's a safety inspection. Now, if, if we were to walk into a property and inspect it with the inspector and smoke detectors are missing, they'll write you up. But you really should have smoke alarms in your property. If the pressure relief valve on the water heater is bad, it could explode. They'll write you up. But you really don't want a water heater to explode in your property. So they are going to look at some things to make sure that the property is safe and habitable. Now, in my mind, that's a positive and not a negative, right? Uh, I've heard horror stories about houses burning down and landlords being liable. With- yeah, no, I, I don't think anyone listening is going to deny that you should have smoke detectors in your house. Right. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are, there are other things, um, you know, that I, I can't think of an example right now. I'll give you one. They can get picky. Like sometimes yeah. window screens, that's a nuisance. Yeah, and right. If I were a landlord, I would be really bummed out about that. Like mm-hmm. having a change of screen because of a tear. But that is no longer even a big deal. They don't even do that anymore in most cases. So the inspections where they used to be even more burdensome, they tried to simplify them because they want more owners in the program. So yeah, they could have been. Also, you don't necessarily have to do an inspection every year anymore. In some cases, it's every two years. You can just self-certify that everything is done. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're making it easier. Okay. So, so you're saying that they are trying to be more landlord friendly then, huh? The program wouldn't exist without landlords, right? So yes, they are trying to, in, in they're trying, that's really why I'm talking to you, right? Mm-hmm. To bring more owners into the program means there's more opportunity for, for the families. Mm-hmm. And the savvy out owners out there, Jason, they really know how beneficial this is monetarily, financially. It's, it's a great program. People make a lot of money with it. Those mm-hmm. savvy investors really do utilize Go Section 8 and the Section 8 program and profit from it. How, how long have you guys been around? 17 years. 17 years. And how do you make your money? Is it you charge for advertising or are there probably a couple of revenue streams? I'm just curious. There's a few. You know, There's yeah. a few. So we do work with government agencies. Our rent comparability software and our waiting list software is something we do charge agencies for. So there's a direct relationship B2B okay. with the government. We do, we do well there. A property owner does go on and they can list for free, but they can upgrade. So it's a freemium model. You're, okay. you're, uh, you're familiar with that. Sure. And the uh, owner, when they upgrade, they can have access to QuickMatch, which is a service that we created that allows you to find Section 8 tenants that are actively searching. It matches them to your property and you can contact them as opposed to having to wait for them to contact you. And we have a giant database of voucher holders that are actively searching and available. And we match up the properties really well to the family based on needs and and their behavior online. Okay, good stuff. That's a good service for owners. Good stuff. What types of properties is this addressing? You know, I've had Section 8 tenants in uh, some rather nice properties I've owned over the years. You know, what what types of properties are are most of the Section 8 properties? Are they kind of like C-class properties or, you know, and I'd be curious to know how high do the rents go in inside the program? So it's all, it crosses all types. It's basically market rent, but it, there's a point where the property becomes unaffordable. There's a point where a family can no longer afford a property and it stops there. So you've heard of fair market rents. Of fair market rents are published by HUD and they're released in October. And the fair market rent in Palm Beach County, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is for three bedroom. But let's just say it's like $1,800. That represents within a certain range, the agency has an ability to set the payment standard, their financial burden, 
anywhere between 90 and 110% of that FMR. That payment standard represents the maximum financial burden to the agency. Now, the family can pay a little bit more, right? They can pay a little bit more based on their income, but typically the family's income is low in order to get in the program. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to go much higher than the fair market rent in the first year. So let's say that if the payment standards are around $1,800, Jason, and the market rents are around $1,800, you're fine up to say around $2,000 or so, but you can't rent a three or $4,000 two or three bedroom in the program. There's a limitation based on how much the family can afford to pay their share. And they're typically, that's typically around 30% of their income. And in in terms of the overall program nationwide, I think our listeners would be curious to know how much of it, you know, how much is paid by the government? You know, it it varies. How does that scale work, right? You know, who who gets all of their rent paid? Who gets part of their rent paid? And how does that Depends work? on how much money the family makes. So if, uh, if there is no income, a family with no income, there's a minimum rent of $50 right now. Typically, it's 50 bucks. That's the minimum. Some families that do very well, they'll pay 30% of it. It could be five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800. Now, some landlords think it's better to have the, owner, the agency pay all the rent, have a no income tenant. Some think it's better to have a tenant that, that has a larger income and pays more, uh, more of the rent. In my experience, usually a family that is, has a little bit, they're paying a little portion of the rent and they have kind of like, um, you know, like some equity in the property by paying a portion of it. They're usually really great tenants, in my experience. So yeah. it's usually about a third is the rule of thumb. It's about 30%. Though. Okay, cool. So 30% paid by the tenant? It's about a rule of thumb, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Um, and is your program totally nationwide? Is it in every county? It's national, yeah. yeah. It's in, okay. uh, yeah, we work with uh, a lot of housing agencies. Uh, nearly 700 of them use the rent comparability software. Mm-hmm. Most families with vouchers use GoSection8.com. Uh-huh. Excellent. And uh, what else do you want to tell people uh, just to wrap it up for us? I would encourage an owner who's considering renting a property out, especially a, a property that would be, you use C class, B class. I'm just saying something that would be in the more affordable sector to, to try a Section 8 tenant. Not only are they going to be financially more secure, they're going to get their market rent, but they're also helping people. And it's just a great way to make money. Excellent. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, the website, we've said it many times, it's Go Section 8. <laughs> thank you, Jason. Good speaking thank you. With you. All right, thanks. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.